Welcome everyone. I'm David Braid, Program Coordinator for Bari uh, with my colleague Shunin and Riley. Uh, we're going to give everyone a few minutes to uh, enter the room and get their seats and get comfortable and uh, we'll get started around 105. Uh, and uh, we thank everyone for being here. So we'll just be a few more minutes, let folks uh, file into the room and we'll get started at 105. Welcome everyone. Uh, we'll get started about two minutes. I uh, guess more folks some time to enter the room. Then we'll then get started at one o five. Hello everyone. Welcome to our um, Bari's uh, uh, community-based training. Uh, we are happy to host you guys. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, City and Community Engagement. Um, this is our second training of the year and we uh, are happy to have you guys. Um, for those, uh, I'm going to introduce Bari and more about the training and then I'm going to pass it off to uh, my, co uh, my colleagues Riley and uh, the Boston Area Research Initiative seeks to spur original cutting edge research in the greater Boston area um, that both advances urban scholarship and analyzes inequities and pushes to improve public policy and practices. Our community based trainings uh, serves to provide leaders like yourselves uh, the resources to confidently gather data, cultivate research questions and advocate for equitable living experiences for your communities. And through this, uh, we can grow an ecosystem of data driven leaders and advocates that use data and technology to make a lasting impact. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to uh, allow my colleagues, Riley and Shannon, to, to introduce themselves. Riley? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Riley Tucker. I'm a PhD candidate in criminology at Northeastern, and I'm also one of the two data consultants uh, for Bari. 
so as the data consultants, our role is really to like spread just like the bar data and kind of like uh, ideology, maybe you can call it kind of like throughout the Boston area, right? So like sometimes it's like people like have a research question they really want to answer, but they don't know about how to use the data or like maybe they have really good data and aren't sure kind of like what is like a meaningful research question. Uh, so our jobs is really to kind of like, uh, you know, we're available to kind of help people uh, through that process, you know, kind of like create uh, knowledge that's like impactful for you. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, part of that is kind of like maintaining our, our data tools. So uh, we're gonna kind of like give you a, a preview to all that today. Uh, and yeah, just like really excited. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out to either Shunan or I after this training, if there's any like lingering questions, like we love getting these emails and kind of like helping you through it. Uh, yeah, so Shunan, you can go ahead and introduce. Yeah, thanks David and Riley. So I'm Shunan Yu, I'm a sociology candidate at Northeastern University, and I'm also one of the data consultants of Bari. So I think Riley has done a, a, a brilliant job in to summarize our job responsibilities. So yes, so besides that, I also collaborate with professors to promote Bari data sets in different uh, class contents and in different disciplines. The purpose of this is to promote Bari data sets within the in North Eastern community. But of course, we also work with community members as well as organize, organizers, since we really want to promote data justice and really to use data to advance for the social good. So yes, well, and so today we're very excited to uh, to do this with you all. And, and yes, if you have any other questions, do not feel hesitate to reach out to us. Awesome. Okay, let's go ahead and get started, Shannon. Sure. So, so our plan is like, so first we want to do a short round of introductions. Since I can see today, we have around 10 pe people as uh, in terms of the participant number. So we first want to do a short round of self-introduction. So we would like to know just some brief information of where you're from and what drives you to today's training, what you want to obtain from today's training and what type of urban issues that you're most interested about and what type of difficulties you've confronted in this way. So I think this will cost us around 15 to 20 minutes at maximum. Then we'll move to Riley's first introduction of the Boston area research map. So we will go through from the visualization part first. And then uh, I will go back to the data library to give you some idea of the raw data sets. Yes, yeah, so let's start from the this uh, brief self-introduction. So how about um, Hester? You, it's it's up to you whether you want to turn on the camera or not. But yes, of course, we would we would definitely be very happy to see your face. <laughs> so how about Hester? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, Hester, I saw you unmute yourself now. Yeah, but we cannot hear you. Just in case you're speaking to us. <laughs> Oh, I see the the connecting to audio thing going. Yeah. So I wonder if there's like some some technical challenge. Okay, maybe Hester, we can move to you back later. Maybe you need some time to adjust in the equipment. Uh, we'll we'll move back to you later. How about Dede? If I pronounce it correctly, Dede. Didi, sorry. Didi. <laughs> oh, so cute. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dee Dee Jacobs Commissar. I'm Institutional Giving Manager at the Huntington Theatre Company. Oh, very cool. So uh, what type of urban issues that, or, or urban related problems that you're most passionate about? Um, well, in terms of my work, um, the Huntington serves about um, 30,000 students each year all over Greater Boston and Massachusetts. Um, and many of them are located in um, Boston's urban communities and also of course, our audience is. So any data that we can find out about who we are serving just helps us serve people better. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Didi. Yeah, I like that, how particular that your interest and how it's really close to our life because we pass through that street every day. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we'll definitely see. Um, yeah, we would like to, to do some Q&A in the end as well, so that you could ask more specific questions towards your research interest or towards to that specific neighborhood. Okay, thank you, Didi. <laughs> so how about the next one? How about Nick? Hi. Uh, I'm Nick. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I am a grad student here at Northeastern. I'm in my final semester of my MPA program, public administration program. Um, in my capstone and in general, I have a history in social work and housing justice, housing advocacy. Um, so housing and everything related to housing are definitely interests of mine. Uh, but in my professional work, I'm also a healthcare quality analyst working at a Boston-based organization that is actually a, a national footprint now. And so I'm very, very curious about the types of data that should exist. Um, so one example that I think is really relevant here is there is currently no data repository for eviction data in Massachusetts um, and even in Boston. And it feels like, especially with the changes in Mayor Lewis administration and some of the interests that um, they're focusing on going forward, I'm really curious about where we could potentially see new data sources around things like evictions and so on and so forth. Um, in the meantime, I have actually been using the Bari portal um, and the Boston Open Data looking at things like uh, landlord complaints and uh, violations related to substandard housing and things like that to try and identify who are like the most notorious landlords by neighborhood, for example, as part of a capstone project. So that's the kind of data I'm currently using and that's the kind of data I'm most interested in in the future to see from this project. Um, and in general, I'm very interested in how students of Northeastern and the community can get involved in Bari, either as students or going forward in you know, projects, volunteering or what have you. So that's something I'm very curious about. Thanks so much, Nick. It sounds like you've, you've been quite familiar with Bari data sets actually. And yes, and we, we could definitely set up another conversation in terms of how we could collaborate more in different types of format. But yes, hopefully, uh, since I saw you are most interested in housing this sector in terms of the eviction and the landlord issues, as well as you also have another interest on healthcare equity. Yeah, hopefully we could both cover this, uh, these two sectors today. And we'll see if we can find some new emergent data for you if in, if in the end you have more questions about the new data resources that you could potentially use in the future. So thank you, Nick. So how about an, uh, the next one, Eva? Hi. Um, so uh, I am, um, I'm a physician over at the Dana-Farber uh, and in conjunction with um, programs that I work on with the medical school, um, there's a growing interest in um, with, is within an organization called Harvard Catalyst, which is part of a big clinical research structure that helps to organize research activities across um, our various different hospitals and institutions and so on. And we have a, a big new grant that we're putting in and it has an increased emphasis on community engagement and um, dissemination to communities. Uh, so I was uh, really struck by um, seeing this, that it would be interesting to understand what Barry does and what it is and whether, you know, whether knowledge of your programs and direction and resources would be things that we can make more visible to, um, our community of investigators so that they can engage and um, see some of this as foundational for collaborative work. Thank you so much, Eva. Yeah, I can definitely see some potential collaborations there since we have those places of interest in terms of community of health centers. We can totally see the location, but we also have those demographic information. So you can totally see how the distribution of community health center are, uh, is totally distributed very in a very different way based on the neighborhoods, based on the racial, I mean, uh, racial, uh, racial groups, as well as a different distance towards work and place. So yeah. I can see lots of potential ways that we could unpack the puzzle that you're most interested in. Theme. Yeah, we, we ran, as an example, to make this more concrete for everybody here, we ran a, um, uh, we, we funded some proposals um, a little over a year ago to work on environmental toxins and health. And we really wanted 
to get proposals that were a little bit more focused on the local community and mm -hmm. that sort of address these kind of very difficult topics in terms of local mm -hmm. impact. So, you know, whether it's the sort of smog corridor across Melnia Cass or whether it's, you know, any of a number of set of other issues, it seems to me the kind of information that you guys have access to or relationships you have, um, if we'd been able to alert people, those might have driven some of the proposals more in that direction instead of a little more abstractly. So um, really looking forward to learning more. Yeah, thanks so much, Eva. That sounds a very super exciting project to me. And we have a sector particular towards environment, even though we don't have many big data sets under that umbrella. But today we'll definitely touch upon a little bit about the current environment related data sets. Right. So thank you, Eva. Yeah, we could chat more later. Um, so how about the next one, uh, Courtney? Hi, I'm Courtney. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the marketing and database analytics coordinator at the Huntington Theater. Um, and I'm new to the Huntington and just to the career field in general. So I'm kind of just here to, um, you know, learn about anything since I don't really have much experience with it. Thank you, Courtney. Yes, I understand that <laughs> we always have lots of audience, well, which has a very general and genuine interest towards data set. They, so today we're going to give an overview of all the data sets we provide, as well as a visualization of it. Hopefully, it could be the first step for you, Courtney, for your yeah. future. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Uh, so how about the next one, uh, Rhythm or Rhythm? <laughs> Um, hi, um, can you see my video? I don't think so. I'm not sure. Uh, we can hear you, but your face is just a black box. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know why. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I cannot so show my face, but I can talk, right? Yeah. So I'm a grad student at Northeastern, currently studying uh, my master's in analytics. Uh, I've been working on some databases from the city of uh, Cambridge, I think, uh, for the sanitary violations and uh, um, the property database, and I'd like to know more about the Bari data sets. Um, I'm currently new to this uh, prospect of this, and I'm still on the learning curve. Maybe I'll learn a couple of things here, and uh, probably some exploratory data, data analysis on your data sets. Yeah, um, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Ryzen. Yeah, we always, Bari has a long history of collaborating with data analysts and data scientists. So hopefully today you could get exposed to Barry data set and probably we could find some potential future collaboration opportunities. So thank you, uh, Reza. Uh, how about next one, Sarah? Hi. Um, I uh, spent my career working um, in data analysis at the Harvard Business School and across the disciplines. And now that I'm retired, I'm a lot I can you know, work on fun stuff. Um, currently, um, I'm working with COVID data from CDC and Johns Hopkins, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at um, using the BARI research, the research indicators to look at mortality and disease inc incidents across the neighborhoods, ethnic groups, and other socioeconomic groups in Boston. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, what you impressed me first is their sentence. Now I'm retired. I can, I can work on something more fun. This is just so impressive. This sentence. Well, it may turn into some consulting, but I'm I'm now just following my passion. And 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 while I loved my career, now now I can just be a complete dilettante across the the um, env data environment. And and I have a real interest in health um, and and epidemiology. So I've been doing that. That sounds really awesome. And that's totally the life that we want to pursue after retirement. <laughs> yes, so, and indeed, we, Barry, we have some COVID related data sets and today we're gonna show it. We both have the uh, COVID vaccination center in the map and we also have oh, some- Oh, good. Yes, and we also have some COVID daily cases 
uh, in Massachusetts, I think that one. And we will also show it in the data. That one is in data library. Yeah, so we will illustrate it later. Perfect, and, thank you. Yes, sure, Sarah. We, hopefully we could chat more in the Q&A session. Um, how about the next one, Alison? Uh, can you hear me, Alison? <laughs> okay, um, so that, let's first move to the next one. Uh, how about Emily? Oh, Al oh, oh, okay, I'll go back to you later, Alison. So Emily first. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Emily. I'm a master's student at Northeastern University studying engineering and public policy. Um, my main interest is interest is in transportation so and right now i'm just trying to learn as much as i can about data and transportation planning and everything before i graduate uh, awesome emily yes so barry we actually have a group a research group has been focused on mobility data sets and there's a bunch of research and papers has been using the cell phone based mobility data to look at how even covid will change people's mobility uh, trajectory so maybe that research may be particularly useful to you yeah though i don't think we're going to touch upon that but you could definitely check out barry's websites to look at that particular transportation and mobility based research and thank you, Emily. Yeah. Uh, so how about the next one, Alison? <laughs> Alison, can you hear us? <laughs> okay, probably later, Alison. I think you could type your information in the chat. And I also see Hester, you uh, uh, you've already typed your information here. So he said he's a grad student at UMass in computer science, and uh, she's inter he's interested in algorithm justice and working on local communities on food and housing justice. Awesome, yeah. Algorith algorithmic justice is a, such a huge concern topic for every discipline now. And I think it's very important because, you know, when we're designing some syllabus uh, using Barry data sets, we're always thinking about data justice related issue, whether the, rep the presentation of the data set, whether they are exploiting the marginalized community or not, and how we could promote a better just, uh, you know, we can provide better data justice in terms of both the data collecting process as well as, well as the data representation process. Yeah, so thank you, Hester, for your interest. And hopefully we could discuss more after today's training com content. So I think now we, I think, so thanks for everyone's interest and participation. I can see we have lots of emerging interest uh, towards uh, towards both like the housing sector. We're gonna cover a lot towards housing. I think another interest sector is on house related to healthcare equity as well as COVID related health impact. And I can also see uh, some other interests related to environment and transportation. Yeah, so I think today we're gonna cover most of this topic, particularly house, health and environment with a little bit touch upon it. And hopefully we could have another conversation after, uh, after this overview of both the map as well as the data library. So then I will give to Riley now. So Riley will first walk you through the research area map. Thanks, June. Uh, and yeah, so just so everyone knows, as you all have been talking, I've been like writing down every uh, topic, like now we're just gonna go through a bunch of data. Uh, and my, my list is exactly the same as what Shunin just reiterated to us. So great minds uh, think alike. Uh, and so, yeah, but like, feel free to like shout out if like there's like something on the screen that you wanna, uh, that you like don't understand or if there's like something that you wanna see of, cause as you'll see, like there's way too much like variables for us to get through all of them uh, today. So like, don't don't feel shy about like interrupting if you're like, oh, I really wanna know what like neighborhood effect on property value means. We'll probably get to that one, um, but just as an example. Uh, and so I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, do you all see a, my uh, web browser? Cool. So this is, the homepage for the uh, Boston Data Portal. This is kind of like, you can think of like, this is like where you start uh, when you want to use our data. And like, we've really kind of tried to make our information as accessible 
to like as many audiences as possible. So like the way I think of it is there's kind of like different levels of engagement. Uh, and so what we're gonna start with is like the research map, which is like really good for learning about the city of Boston, learning about the neighborhoods visually. Uh, but there's like one level up where like you really wanna like download the Excel data and you know, like maybe play around with it in R, that kind of thing. At that kind of level, uh, you're gonna wanna think about like the Boston data library, which is what Shunin will present to you in a little bit, which is where you can like download our, our raw data and play with it uh, for yourself. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to click on the Boston area research map link here. And this takes us to our mapping hub. So this is uh, based on uh, like a, a web service offered by Esri, who has like the ArcGIS software, if you've ever heard of it, just like a very kind of like popular technology for creating maps. Uh, and there's kind of like Kind of, I think of this like web page is being split in two. Uh, so we're going to start with the data categories section. And so the idea here is that you could kind of like come on this website and like, you know, there's a button. Each of these pictures is actually like a button that you can press. And these kind of represent like the broad topics that we kind of feel like we have enough information to like speak to and teach people about. Uh, and so, uh, I'm actually gonna start with people and environments and then after I'm gonna shoot the housing. Uh, I just think it's like the, the census is kind of like an easy uh, thing to make sense of. So what I've done, just kind of reiterating that, is I've clicked on the people environments button here and now uh, it brings us to uh, uh, a map here, right? And so, uh, as you probably recognize, we have a city of Boston here, uh, but what those color means is like a whole kind of like ambiguous thing. Uh, so the first thing that you might want to do is turn on a legend. Uh, and so the legend button is this thing in the upper right hand corner. And so if I click on it, it tells us that we are looking at a map of median household income. Right, and so right here, this is kind of like what our, our variable is. And then we have a legend here, right? So kind of like what this is telling us is that in the neighborhood, they're in that, that white color, the median household income for the neighborhood is like $43,000 or below, right? And then kind of like as the colors turn darker blue, you have neighborhoods who are earning kind of like a, a higher income, uh, on, on average. Uh, and so we can close this and we can turn it back on, on and off. Uh, you can also scroll in. So uh, they, they changed this. So you used to have to use the button here, but now you can use it just like if you're using Google Maps, like if you have like the scroll wheel on your mouse, you can just like push it forward and you can zoom in. I'm gonna make my window a bit bigger. Uh, you can zoom in and get really up close. Uh, and then you can actually like say you're interested in a single a single neighborhood and you just like want to know what the median uh, income of that neighborhood is, you can click on it. Uh, and so it's like sometimes a little bit tricky. You might need to like zoom in. Uh, but you'll see like when you get this little blue outline in here. And so this is kind of like our the fancy kind of like code version of the of the variable name. Uh, what it means is that like the median household income for this polygon I've selected or neighborhood is uh, 69,000, uh, right? And so kind of like, uh, it's nice, you can, you know, zoom out and see the whole city, but you can also kind of like click on specific neighborhoods uh, that you're interested in. Uh, and sorry, I'm not sure that I, I mentioned that this is from the census. So there's this button up here, if I click it, like it'll just bring us back to where we are because we're already on the, the census data. Uh, so this is from the American Community Survey. Every year they kind of like go out and talk to people in between uh, big decennial censuses. And so that's what we're looking at just for context. Uh, and so as you know, if you've ever taken a census before is that like income is just one of many, many things that people are asked about. Uh, and so we might be curious to look at something else. Uh, and so the first thing we need to do is actually turn off our economic uh, variable here, because like what we have is a layer. 
right so like this map is just like a layer that gets like glued down on top of it you can imagine we can layer other stuff on top of that but it's going to get confusing so the first thing i'm going to do is turn this off and so if you see like here is like where our economic standing variables are there's actually many which you can see if you uh click that triangle uh you can see we have like an eyeball for median household income which means that we're looking at it uh so if i turn that off we have no no data being shown right uh and you can also turn off entire categories so if i turn off all of the eyeballs here this is like the blank template right there's like no possible uh variables that are going to show uh someone mentioned that they were interested in transportation and i always think this one is really interesting so we have uh these maps on commute methods so like how do people uh get to work on on average in each neighborhood and so to look at that i first need to turn on the eyeball for commute methods so now we have like access to those variables if we want to look at them and then if i click the eyeball for commute by walking all of a sudden we have a map up for the the walking population right and so we pull up the legend again uh so what the colors represent here is the percentage of people in each neighborhood who said they walk to work rather than other types of kind of like transportation and so i mean it's really not surprising right uh people who live downtown uh where all the jobs are right kind of like have the the agency or kind of like the leisure to be able to walk to work if they so choose whereas you know as you kind of like get out from the city center it, like people are going to be a lot more you know far away from the job centers uh walking is not kind of like as reasonable uh so your question might be like well in these neighborhoods on the urban periphery how do people get to work uh and so uh, we have these other ones that we look at right like the one that comes to mind for me would be uh public transportation public transportation is a walk at a washout just because like everyone in the city uh is apparently using public transport to to go to work however if we look at uh driving in cars to work really big neighborhood differences right it's like these people on the kind of like the southern and northern tip of boston are kind of like the only people who are driving to work which is if you've ever driven to boston you know it is really unpleasant right it's like the people who are driving to work are probably only those uh who really need to right so i mean like this is like really an equity story right it's like there's some neighborhoods where people kind of have like this really like nice situation where they can uh walk to work uh and then others kind of like don't have that same that same leisure uh and this is like heavily kind of like connected to income stuff like if we go back to uh economic standing right it is like these neighborhoods generally that are kind of like earning the most downtown are also those people who are able to walk to work right so it's like a privilege of being able to walk and i think it's it's cool that just kind of like looking at just like a couple of these polygon maps is able to uh tell that story and so i like to start with the census just because i think it's like familiar to people like people have taken the census before uh and I, it kind of like contextualizes uh all of like the other patterns that we'll be looking at uh before i go kind of like into the housing stuff i wanted to look at the uh urban heat island really quick just because like i think it's super cool i think at least one person mentioned like that they were interested in the kind of like interplay between uh environment and health uh so i've to get over here we were here before i just clicked this red button urban heat island and then it brings us over to kind of like a whole other set of data right so this urban heat island project uh it was like done by Bari and some collaborators a few years ago they used this data where there was like they put sensors i think like uh every like 30 yards from each other or something like that like you can imagine like they just like went out with like environmental sensors and they just put them like all over uh the city of boston and so what we're looking at right here is a map of heat 
because I mean, it's interesting. Like I, I ask this question to my undergrad sometimes in, in class and I'll say like, oh, like, do you imagine that like some neighborhoods in Boston are like hotter than others? Or do you imagine that like Boston as a city just has like a singular temperature? Uh, and generally the, the response is like, oh, I, it's like one city, like one temperature, right? That's what you see when you uh, look up the weather. Uh, but in reality, kind of what we see here is that there is like huge equity in uh, kind of like where the heat is in the city. And so if we look at the legend here, uh, in the coolest areas that are in the light red, the average, so these are on um, heat emergencies days. So these are like the hottest days of the year. How hot does it get in each neighborhood? In kind of like the Southern uh, half of the city, uh, on average, it gets to like, you know, 95 degrees or cooler, which granted is like very hot still. But if you compare that to kind of like East Boston and downtown, it gets 103 degrees there, right? That's like almost a 10 degree difference on like the same exact day uh, just across neighborhoods. And so, uh, I mean, that has a lot of health implications. Uh, there's like some research that our director, Dan O'Brien, has done, which has found that like at the block level, uh, there tends to be like more 911 calls uh, for like medical emergencies on heat days, like if you're on a block that is hot. So it's like, you know, we don't have like the smaller geographic scales there, uh, but this like really matters for kind of like people's health and safety. Uh, and then kind of like a, a logical question would be, well, why are uh, some parts of the city hotter than others? Uh, and one that we've looked at is kind of like green space, right? So kind of like this idea that if you have trees that are up blocking the sun, then it's not gonna be as kind of like cool underneath. And indeed, right, so like the areas that have more green are where more trees are. It's like these two maps are almost like opposites of each other, uh, where you can kind of like really see that these areas that have all of the, the trees and stuff uh, are those same neighborhoods that also have coolest. So it's interesting because like a, a policy intervention then to kind of like improve health in East Boston could just be adding trees or something, right? Because you see East Boston is like super hot. And then we look at the tree canopy, there is almost like none out here, right? So I mean, that's like, uh, I don't know, I just think that's, that's interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to move on from the people and environment stuff. We can, we'll have another opportunity to kind of like look at uh, variables or anything else that we want to look at. But I'm going to, X out of that, still on our, our homepage here. Uh, and I'm gonna go to housing and land. Uh, so here, as you can kind of like imagine, uh, let me clear up our screen for a little bit. There we go. Uh, so these are where all of our different uh, property data live. Uh, and so as you can see up here, we have a lot and we kind of categorize these in like two groups of data. So one is city data, right? Like in both this topic and others, there's a lot of data where like some data scientist at the city of Boston sends us a Excel file or like many Excel files and we process those to make uh, kind of like neighborhood level measures. And so one of these uh, is the property assessment database. Uh, and so this is like the city, it's kind of crazy to think about, but the city maintains a data set on every single uh, like parcel of land in the city. So I think there's like 189,000 or so of these like plots of land in the city kind of like uh, keeps track of every one of those. And there's like so much information, like for every like building, you can see like how many bathrooms there are, like what the square footage is, just like, bedrooms, just kind of like anything architectural style. Like there's like 180 variables, I think, on that raw data uh, that it describe like each plot of land. Uh, so there's like a whole lot that you can kind of do with that. Uh, oh, was there a question? Okay. Uh, and so one thing that's kind of like low hanging fruit to look at would be uh, land value. So this is right, like for each building, uh, we know how much uh, like the tax assessed value is and we know the square footage. So you can kind of calculate uh, land value. Uh, 
and so yeah so this is like a, a dollar amount per square foot that we're looking at uh it's interesting because you can see there are like these small pockets throughout boston that are like all next to each other uh where there is like really really high value uh land right so i mean like i mean immediately you can tell there's like it's interesting you have some places uh that have a really high residential value next to places that have low i think that some of these zeros are because it's like all commercial buildings um but i mean you can clearly see that there's like a a, a small number of like uh high value hot spots uh in the city and i mean we can compare that to non-residential uh which yeah i mean that's just like a kind of messy i guess because of there's like a couple neighborhoods that just have like really expensive uh buildings right so like one way you can kind of think of value is just like in pure uh dollar amounts but we have uh this map that kind of like tells i think it's like a little bit of a richer story so uh what this is called is neighborhood effects on property value and what the way you can think of it is that imagine like this is like a neutral neighborhood demonstrated by kind of like the the yellow color there uh imagine that you have a building there with like all of its characteristics like you know you can imagine just like whatever building you want and imagine like someone took a bulldozer and like took up that that building with like all of its characteristics and nothing's breaking right there's like hypothetical uh and so like if that bulldozer drops that house in another neighborhood what happens to the value and so the areas in green are places where that building, nothing changes with the building, right? All that happens is you move the building's location uh, and the value goes up if you're kind of downtown. However, if instead of dropping it like right downtown, you're dropping it in, uh, you know, like Dorchester or East Boston, uh, the value of that goes down, right? And it's like really interesting because it's like there is like a social kind of like dimension of like where where property value comes from, right? Uh, and I mean, like we can have a long conversation and maybe we want to spend some time on this, like uh, at the end is thinking about like, why is it that, you know, kind of like Roxbury and Dorchester have a negative effect, you know, put a really nice building there and it kind of like loses value. Uh, so it's interesting, right? It's like a real equity story. Cause I mean, you know, uh, people are less incentivized to develop in these areas where like their their value is going to decrease right but it's like people need services there uh and deserve services there so it's like i don't know it's kind of a uh important kind of like thing to be paying attention to i think uh and so this is all from the 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 property assessments we also have uh building permits so every time uh someone wants to build a building change a building or destroy a building uh they're supposed to like put in some paperwork with the the city of boston uh so every time someone turns in a paperwork uh the city of boston data scientist like makes a new row in their data with all that information uh and then at the end of each year they pass that along the bar team and we create these kind of like neighborhood level uh metrics so what we're looking at right now is a map of uh new construction on our cable that shouldn't be there uh our legend is here uh and so this is a percentage uh uh yeah and so i mean it's like probably not that too surprising like most of the new construction uh is happening kind of like downtown ish uh again just like really big i mean with all these maps it's just like really kind of like breathtaking like how how much inequity there is between neighborhoods right like just like a real checkerboard uh where like some neighborhoods are seeing like a lot of construction and then others are having like you know barely any zero uh and so this is like i mean these are kind of like capturing gentrification processes as you can imagine like this is where uh new development you know the uh gentrifiers are building new stuff in a land that didn't have any uh, another way that can happen is you can take a building that has like uh you know like older features or whatever or kind of like less desirable to the market features and you can like change those to increase value right so we have uh additions which is like even more concentrated uh kind of in the center city area 
uh, and we have renovations, uh, and we have uh, alterations. And finally, uh, right, if you're going to do new construction, there needs to be like an empty plot of land for you to build that on, which means that likely there was demolition that occurred at some point, uh, which we can see here. Right, so I mean, it's just kind of interesting. I, I'm not like personally a housing researcher, I'm a criminologist, uh, but like I can imagine like for a housing researcher, kind of like thinking of these like different mechanisms through which like new housing gets made or kind of like removed. Uh, there's like a lot of different angles to, to think about this. And so these all come from the city of Boston data, but that's not the only way that you can kind of like measure uh you know housing and land value and stuff and so as a lab we've kind of gotten really into using these like online based data sets uh and so one that i think is worth spending a little bit of time is craigslist so right as we speak and at all times in theory uh we have a, a scraper going on craigslist right so like we like wrote a computer program that like once a day it goes on to craigslist it makes a list of every single listing that's off. It like takes all the text off it. Uh, and then it processes that into a data set. So we release a data set that's kind of like every listing for housing posted on Craigslist. Uh, and then we take those like listing level information and just aggregate it to create some neighborhood level metrics. Turn everything off so we can know what we are looking at here. Um, so just kind of like we were looking at before, we can look at. Uh, median rent. So, uh, you know, just kind of like a different way. If I go back to property assessments, it's going to like delete our progress, but just kind of like, you know, the Craigslist representation of how much people pay for rent versus like the property assessments representation of like how much a building is valued. So just like a little bit of a, uh, of a shift. And these are cool since it's like from Craigslist rather than the census, we can slice and dice it however we want. Uh, so we have rental values going uh, from month to month in 2020. Uh, so this would be like meaningful for any stories that you want to tell about like, I don't know, how did, what happened with like housing insecurity during COVID, you know, and how did kind of like the rental market uh, respond to that. Uh, in addition, kind of uh, from like the, just like frequency of like movement in the market, we have listing frequency. So this is like a count of uh, how many listings were made in each neighborhood, which is like super interesting, right? Because as you can see here, uh, Craigslist is like really just representing a sample of all uh, apartments in the city. Like if you wanted to live in like one of these neighborhoods, uh, you're gonna have a hard time finding them on Craigslist, right? There's like other kind of like mechanisms through which, uh, you know, housing turnover happens there. Um, so that's interesting, right? Like. Uh, different data sets kind of like allow you to like just get like a little new angle uh, on a story. So we, we really always like kind of like these like multi-data approaches to kind of one one topic. Uh, all right. Uh, so in the interest of time, I want to show one more thing and then I'm going to show you our playground. Uh, so the last thing I have on my list here is health. Uh, and we, we don't have that much, I uh, will warn you. Oh, uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, so we have 911 data on medical emergencies. Like every year we get 911 data from the city of Boston. And it's just like a whole bunch of call codes. So as you can see here, we have uh, codes for different types of uh, crime events. However, of course, people also call 911 when like someone's having a health emergency. Uh, so in our data that Shunin will show you in a couple of minutes, we do have columns for like in each neighborhood. This is how many uh, ambulances were called. And this is how many ambulances were called for youth health emergencies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have those on the map portal right now, but making a note so we can make sure to get uh, the health stuff. Yeah, I mean, health has been kind of a challenge because there's a lot of like HIPAA stuff behind it, like uh, at least like from what I've seen, like the health organizations are like very careful about uh, sharing data out. So, I mean, you know, as far as conversations about emerging data go, like the health sector is, would be like a really interesting place to think about like, hey, like what kind of data like could be published that would also kind of like be fair uh, 
uh, I don't know, to people who have health emergencies and that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so moving on past that. Uh, yeah, so I, th I think it makes sense to move on to the playground. So as you can see with these maps, like there's like a whole bunch of information that you can get, right? There's like all kinds of variables and stuff, uh, but there's like really not much that you can do to like fulfill your inner artist, right? There's like very little kind of like manipulation that you can do with this. Like there's no way of changing the color there's no way of uh, kind of like taking the stuff out or just like changing it. There's like nothing really that you can do from the screen as far as changing kind of like the aesthetics of your map or kind of like the, the information communicated. So what we have done is we have made a data playground. And so the idea is that like, if you've learned what you want from the map, but it doesn't quite look right for like, you know, your, uh, like a report, like a grant report or uh, application or whatever, uh, then you can go to the data playground uh, and there's like some more buttons, right? Because there's a little more flexibility, but this is a screen where you can really kind of like uh, create your own maps to kind of like fit your, your projects and stuff. So if we go over to layers, uh, this is very similar to uh, what we were looking at before. But instead of like one of these uh, envelopes just being like a couple different like variables of interest, each one of these is like an entire data set from the other page, right? There needs to be a layout where you can access like every single data set that we have uh, all at once. And so I'm gonna go to uh, property assessments. And so we look at energy efficiency before. Uh, if I turn on this eyeball, uh, all of a sudden, we have a map of energy efficiency. Uh, and I'll keep this open. And so this is like just like you could do all this from the other one. Uh, but if I click on it again, and we get that blue box, on the right side, we now have a panel that lets us do like all kinds of stuff as far as changing the appearance. Uh, and so if we go to styles, uh, so you might want to change kind of like the direction. Like right now, our, our green is telling us like where the energy efficiency places are. Maybe instead you wanted to like have your map say like, hey, these are places with low energy efficiency that we need to kind of like target with some intervention. If I go to this theme here, and change from high to low. Oh wait, oops, uh, that's what I have to do. If I go to style options, you can click this button, which is like kind of like a reverse. And if I click it, all of a sudden, it's the places that are inefficient, which are kind of like represented by our color. And so maybe uh, you the narrative that you want to present to your viewers is like this is a problem right like these places are like using energy inefficiently like this is a bad thing like we want to highlight these as like places that like have bad stuff going on that needs to be addressed uh what you might want to do is change the screen to something that's like more of like a warning like something bad is here uh and so if you go to symbol style you can change the colors. So like kind of like standard way of communicating warning would be a red. So if I click uh, red here, then all of a sudden we have our map in that kind of tone, right? So now, uh, oh, where did my legend go? Um, well, that's fine. Now we have kind of like our, uh, the areas that are like low energy efficiency are in uh, dark maroon and the places that are kind of like not having a problem are in light, right? So like color is really useful uh, for telling stories. Um, you can also change like the background map. I think this is really cool because it just goes a long way to kind of like making things uh, look nicer. Uh, so the thing about energy efficiency, you might want to know just like what is like going on with like the buildings and kind of like the topography underneath. Uh, you can use a satellite image. And so instead of having just like 
the Google Maps thing. It is a satellite image. And you might be saying like, well, this is nice, but it would be really helpful if I could zoom in and see kind of like what's going on uh, underneath there. If I, I'm gonna go back, highlight this again, uh, go to style options. Uh, sorry, I think it's actually properties. Yes. So under properties now, there is a transparency dot here. As I drag it, we will be able to see a little deeper kind of like behind there, right? So now we have a story about kind of like energy efficiency, but one could also like zoom in and kind of like start to, to think about kind of like the urban structure that lies underneath kind of like the, these patterns in energy. Um, and uh, so we are about uh, running on time for kind of like my portion of, of this. Uh, and so in a moment, Shunin will kind of like go through the raw data uh, with you all and kind of how to access it and do some, uh, you know, kind of like Q&A as a group. Uh, but before I pass it off to Shunin, uh, does anyone have any questions about kind of like the, the mapping resources that I've presented here? All right. Well, you can always like, as I said before, uh, we're always happy to kind of like uh, help people use these tools over email and stuff or over Zoom, whatever. Uh, so if like after this training, you end up on the playground and you're like trying to do something that you're not sure how to, or like you just get stuck on something, please reach out. Like we'd love to kind of like, uh, you know, figure out kind of like how this tool can be useful for you. Uh, on that note, I will uh, pass it off to Shun. Yeah, thanks so much, Riley. Uh, so now I will give you a brief overview of the data library. So I'll share my screen first. So you can see here, let's first go back. So this, uh, so in this website that Riley just showed you before, so this one. So you can see here, it has two components. So we've just have a brief, uh, so Riley has already helped you to walk through this map. So now I'm gonna help you to walk through this data, uh, Boston data library. So uh, as we've already mentioned, we want to give you first the visualization so that you can see the, this equity, you can see the segregation very clearly on the map. But after you get a gut feeling of what's going on in this area, you also want to have some raw numbers so that you can calculate these differentiations or difference or the, these segregations in a more accurate way with numbers. So this is a place where this data playground can play a role. So before dive in that, I would like to first for you to remember, if you're new to Boston Data Library, always click this user guide, even though it said COVID in Boston Database User Guide, but actually this is a user guide for anyone who's new to this platform. So if you click this and it will, so you can see here, uh, it's, so if you click this PDF, so you need to download it. So here it will give you some understanding of the component of the Barry data sets, as well as some data resources. So you can see here, we have basically two types of data set. One is online data resources. Another one is administrative data resources. So Riley now, the, he has already given you a good sense of the categorization based on the data contents, including housing, including demographic and environments, as well as the crime and disorder as well as, as commerce. However, those categorizations are really based on the contents and the themes of the data set. This categorization is based on data resources. So based on data resources, we categorize our data set in, into these two categories. One is online data resource and another one is administrative data resources. So under this online data resources, we have these data sets, Craigslist, Yelp, Airbnb, places of interest. Under administrative data resources, 
resources. We have property assessment. I think Riley has already mentioned uh, building permits, code violation, food inspection, city score. So the, what's the meaning behind this categorization? So for online data categories, basically we have a robot who will scrape data daily every day for us. And our job is to scrape all the data set from the website and then download it, clean it, and do some data analysis. But for the administrative data set, like Riley also mentioned, like we get data set from the city of Boston, from the local or state government. So this is a very brief differentiation between these two type of data resources. And as we also have already mentioned, we have these category categorizations for the data content for the data contents. And also we have another one is based on the methodological application. You can see whether how we link them together, since you know the most powerful tool for borrowed data sets is that they can all be linked together. This, like for example, Riley has already showed you the data playground. You can uh, you can totally combine different layers and you can generate your own map. The same logic applies to the data analysis. Since th these data sets, they can all be connected with some point data set or just polygon data. So this can really give you a very powerful tool that you can link all this data together through the geocode or through the census track level. It's really based on which geographical level you're looking at. So this is the first thing I would like for you to pay attention to when you are browsing uh, Boston area, uh, the data library. So after this, I would like to go through several, uh, several data sets that we just have already mentioned. So I would like to first to go through, for example, Airbnb, since I know lots of you are very much interested in the housing, uh, housing area. So let's click Airbnb. So in Airbnb, I would like to say, so when you click it, this is a website and here we have a very a brief description it will tell you the data resources of this data set for example here we saw this airbnb listings are processed and released by insiderairbnb.com so this is a website that the robot scripts the data for us and also it will give you all the information like in including all types of variables and the time length of these data sets. So before you download any data, data set, I would like to pay for you to pay attention to the Airbnb data documentation, because this is like the guidebook for this data set. So this same logic applies to any other data sets. For a new data set, whenever you want to dig into it, whenever you want to download it, please, please first read into this documentation because this will give you a sense of what it is and how you could potentially use it in your own research. So if you click this button, you can see uh, this means download access file and this eyeball means preview. So we should access it. So we choose download and the format is PDF format. Here it will ask you to put your brief information here and you accept and then it will naturally uh, download it here. So let's have a look of what this data means. So here you can see this, it will first give you an overview of the timelines of it, how many listings it's scraped and the data resources and uh, what are the data resources. And it will also give you a sense of the components of this data set. So for example, here we have a listing data set, which is purely the information about the rental properties listed on Airbnb. And we also have another one, it's the aggregated measure, which is based on the neighborhood level. So here, then we have a table of contents. You can see here will give you a sense of the summary of variables, and then we will give you a sense of the neighborhood metrics. This is very helpful because of, you know, when you look at the map, so I'll go back here a little bit. I want to under, I want you to all understand the meaning of it. So if you just, for example, uh, you click the Airbnb here, so for example, on the Air Airbnb, you may not really quite understand the listing frequency by month, even though, I mean, it's very straightforward, absolutely. But we also want to know which year is it. And maybe, for example, this one is easy to understand, but for example, in another data set, for example, the neighborhood, uh, the, uh, the Boston neighborhood survey, for example, this one, you can see the variable is called social cohesion, informal social control. When you are browsing these websites on the map, you may get confused about what's the meaning of these words. Some words are very visible and very understandable, like the listing frequency, 
but there are also some variables listed, listed in the map that it's not that easy to digest, for example, the social cohesion or informal social control. Under these circumstances, that's it's very important to go back to the uh, to the PDF document because it will give you a very accurate explanation of the meaning of each variable. So for example, here, let's have a look. Summary of variables and we click here and then it will tell you. So we first have Airbnb description test. It will include the name, summary, uh, space, description, all these variables. And we also have listing characteristics, including time, year, months, listing, property, and so many informations about how many bedrooms it has, the minimum nights. So I would like to mention Airbnb is really a huge data set if you're interested in housing. It's also one of my favorite data set, actually. It has around, I think, almost 100 variables. So and it's it's really a very comprehensive data set and it also covers so many different aspects including the uh, the airbnb descriptive descriptive text uh, in terms of the basic living conditions of airbnb and we also have these uh, listing characteristics and we also have host characteristics so for example some uh, some students are interested in whether this person is a super host or not and we also have this because usually when we book airbnb we always want to book the Airbnb, which has a super host. And we also have another variable it's called the review metrics. So for, for example, here it has it will tell you number of reviews, number and reviews per month, first review, last review, review score rating, review scores, review score in terms of their cleanliness, check-in, location. So you can see it's really detailed and it will really uh, gives you a lot of information in terms of the review of this Airbnb listing and or the review of this person of the host whether this uh, this listing is hosted by uh, uh, by a rental company or by a rental pr uh, or, by, or 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 it's rented by single individuals so you can really lots lot uh, ask lots of questions related to this very comprehensive data set so for example i used to have students who are very much interested in uh, what uh, they ask the question whether the distance of airbnb uh, the distance from the university universities or the distance from the subway station, the train station, whether this distance will shape the final price of the Airbnb. Since we're so convinced that uh, Boston is a, a college uh, is a college town. So some students will, uh, will like to ask the, the impact of the distance towards the train station or towards the university, how will this shape the price? And you could also ask whether the person, the renter is a super host or not, whether this will shape the final uh, rental price or not. So you can really ask a lot of questions. So this is a thing I would like you to all keep in mind. Whenever you touch upon a new data sets, always go to the documentation first, click access file and click this PDF. So after you read through all the documentation, you have a better understanding of the meaning of each variable and you have a better understanding of what type of questions you may be interested in. This is a time for you to download the raw data set. So here I would like to mention, you can see we do, uh, because after, during this uh, documentation, you also know it's composed by the, uh, by the listing as well as the neighborhood level. So you can see the other three documents, this is a listing, this is a neighborhood level, and we have another one, it's called shapefile. This file is for, is for data visualization. So whenever you want to make your own map, since you know in the, uh, in the map that Riley just showed you, we actually only presented one third of our data sets on the map. So there are so many other data sets that we posted in the data library, but we didn't really visualize it in the map. So if you're interested in those, uh, those data sets that we didn't realize it in the map, as long as when you click it and you find it has the shape file, just download the shape file and then you can upload it, it in the ArcGIS. Today, we're not gonna go through that in detail, but if you're interested in that part, just feel free to shoot us another email when we finish this training. But I just want to tell you, as long as you see it has a shape file, that means this data set is totally visualizable in the map and it's super easy to do actually. So let's click this, let's try to download this data set. It's very easy and very straightforward. Click this. 
click access file and click comma separated value. This is the name for CSV. CSV is the abbreviation for this term. So if you click this one and the same process, put your personal information here and accept it. And then you can see this one is is downloading now Airbnb listing CSV data set. So how to open and do some data analysis with this CSV file? So you can totally open it in any data analysis software, including R or Python or SAS, SPSS. They are all importable to those specific data and an analytical software that you use in your daily life. So this is very powerful and you can do all types of exploratory data analysis based on these data sets. It's super fun to do as well. You can definitely calculate the mean price for the Airbnb during January and the mean price for Airbnb during uh, February. So you can do so many exploratory data analysis. So this is a very fun data set I would like to mention that is Airbnb and it has so many variables for you to dig into. So after this, I would like to, I think you can, uh, based on this logic, you can definitely go through other data sets. And now I just want to mention COVID since I've seen um, just some emerging interest towards COVID data set. So, so Barry's data sets about COVID is many, this one that is COVID weekly and daily cases by town in Massachusetts 2021. Mm -hmm. So if we click this one, you can see it will also give you a sense uh, it will also give you a sense of what it is. So it includes COVID weekly and daily cases by town in Massachusetts. And it also tells you the uh, data span from April, uh, April 1st, 2020 to January 19th, 2021. And we have the daily and weekly cases. So you can see here, if you're inter particularly interested in COVID related data set, click this PDF first, and then you can download them. The same process, if you're interested, click access file and the same process applies to these daily, daily and weekly cases. So I think this is pretty much straightforward. I would like to just go through, I think one, and I think Riley didn't mention that we actually have the vaccination site here. Um, I will just show you here briefly. I think he, he didn't, he doesn't have time to show you previously. So if you click this point of interest, here and we have this vaccination site and also let's first click uh, to, to turn it off and if we click this vaccination site so this one is a vaccination site of COVID in the whole Massachusetts area. So I think this is also very interesting for you to combine them together. If you can see the vaccination sites and you also get the data set for the daily and weekly cases based on uh, differentiated by town, you can totally see uh, how, what's the correlation between this vaccination site and the daily cases. So, and also how it can be linked with racial and social and socioeconomic status. So I think these are lots of interesting questions for uh, people who are interested in health equity to, uh, to ponder about. So I would like to mention uh, one more thing, I think, which is very helpful for you, that is ACS data set. Uh, I think Riley has already shown you in the map, that is the uh, demographic information, that one. So we also have this raw data set of ACS data set. So if you click this button, Massachusetts Census Indicators, if you click it, and then it will give you a brief introduction of it, as well as the documentation of it. So here you can see it contains the decennial census and the American Community Survey. This is a so ACS is the abbreviation for American Community Survey. So as for the decennial census indicators, it exists as block, block group, and tractor level. So this is what I've already mentioned as a different geographical uh, levels. So and we, we, we have to combine data set based on the same level. For example, you've combined two, two data sets, both based on their tractor level or block level. This you have to match. And you can see here, ACS indicators are only at the block level and tractor level. And you can also see the data resources. It includes the ACS community data sets. It's created usually, uh, usually it's based on every five years. And you can see here, where if you want to do some longitudinal analysis to see how the demograph demographic information has changed over time, you can see here, we actually have data sets since uh, 0509 means from 2005 till 2009. So 
you can see this means from 2006 to 2010. This is 2000, uh, yeah, same. This is 2007 to 2011. So you can actually see we have the demographic information every five years. So if you're interested to see some longitudinal changes of ACS data set over time, I think the latest is 16 to 2020, even though we may have not uploaded yet. Uh, but even the one posted here, I think the latest is also around 14 to 18 at least. Yeah, it's here, 14 to 18. It's from 2014 to 2018. So this means we actually have ACS data set from 2006 to 2018. So if you're interested to see how the demographic information changes over time, this data set is very helpful. And also, as Riley showed you, this is also a super comprehensive data set, including the gender, the race, their educational level, their commute to work, uh, as well as lots of other uh, information. So they are very handy to, to be combined with other data sets. So I think these are the main content. I think before I end this session, I would like to just to mention, we, we really have a, a lot of other data sets in this one that we didn't have time to show you today. So if you, uh, if, I want to show you some other data sets that we didn't have time to put it in the map. So for example, if, okay, let's still go back here. Because you can see here, we actually have so many, uh, have at least 40, uh, have 45 data sets. So you can see we also have 311, 911 call. We don't have time to show you today. And we also have city score. This one, we didn't do visualization in the map. And this with and COVID data sets, we also didn't realize it in the map, but you could totally do some uh, raw data analysis here. And you can see we also have food inspection violation. I think if you're particular, like uh, Hester, you're particularly interested in food justice, maybe you're interested in this data set. And we also have this, yeah, this we've already mentioned the property assessment, but we also have some other. Uh, other data sets, for example, like Boston Climate Change Resilience and Preparedness Checklist data set. This one for someone who's particularly interested in environment could be very helpful and handy, even though we only put urban heat island in the, in the data sets. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> and, and we could also see we have some administrative data sets and we also have some Boston area deposition and soil solution data sets. So yeah, I just want to mention based on your own interest, uh, I think that we have lots of other interest for you to look upon. I would also like to mention one more thing for the data playground. I think Riley doesn't have time to mention today, but when you're making your own map, just to remember uh, when you're making your own map, you could always add a layer. And when you add layer, you can see you, we actually have lots of other layers for you to choose. And if you combine it with, if you log in with your own account, you, are, you can find other layer. For example, if you're interested in redlining. Okay, I think it, if you click it into ArcGIS Online, so there's lots of choices. You can choose my own content. This is only the barry, uh, this is only barry layer. So we don't have any layer related to redlining. But if you change it to ArcGIS Online, you can see we have lots of uh, redlining related layers and it's very easy to add it. So for example, let's do this, add this one to your map, to the map. Then you can totally see we have, this is the score actually. A, B, C, D, this is a, a grading for different neighborhoods. And if you combine it, for example, with Barry's layer uh, of the racial just of the race, I think you could have lots of interesting results. For example, you're interested in black and you want to combine these two layers together. Uh, for example, this one, but this one is a, a tractor layer. So, I just want, I think I don't have time to do this myself, but I just want to mention that there's, uh, there's around 4,000 or 5,000 layers in ArcGIS online actually. So it's always remember, you can see here, we have North America rail line and lots of weird and very interesting layers in 
ArcGIS online that we have no idea where they get this from actually. Like the areas of outstanding natural beauty or world imagery or terrain or just some priority river habitat. So always remember if you cannot find the layers in BARI data sets, go to ArcGIS online because this is a whole data space all over the play, all over the world. So they may have this, for example, you're interested in redlining that we don't have this historical redlining there, but you may find it in ArcGIS online. Yeah, so I think that's my part. And then I can open for discussion now if you have any questions that, uh, that you're interested in to ask or any comment. We'd love to hear about you know, how this can possibly help you in your, uh, in your research efforts going forward. Hi, I have a question about some demographics. We are interested in learning about certain communities, such as the Latinx community, the Asian community in Boston. How could we use these tools to find out uh, more about where these communities are, are centered and what other kind of filters should we be using? Yeah, thanks for your question. Yes, yeah, so basically, I think the most helpful layer is the foreign born layer. So, you know, in this ACS data set, we have the categories, the racial category includes, uh, includes Asia, includes uh, Latin, Hispanic, including white, but we have another category, it's called foreign born. So I think that one, maybe it's worthwhile to look into. But I mean, it's also, I think, I believe your interest is also on second generation immigration, right? Yeah, so I think foreign, uh, foreign born is many refers to the first generation. So I think I will also recommend uh, MBTA because I, let me send you that website. I think uh, for ACS data set, it's not that detailed. Even going to that much particular into Asian American community or Latino Latinx community, that's a bit too much for, because ACS is a national survey to cover such detailed information. So I think I will suggest you to go to some Boston related websites, like for example, this one, uh, BD Boston BDP. I'll send you this website. I think it has a very nice uh, map about the racial demographic within the Boston area. But you can totally see based on that map, actually the ethnic communities, they're highly hybrid. And, and they're really not like, OK, this area is homogeneous, but it's actually really heterogeneous. But I think, yeah, let me check if I can find that website. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Melanie? Hi, uh, it's Melanie. Um, yeah. uh, I am a director of community engagement at Boston Children's Museum. Uh, I do apologize. I, the link went to my junk email, so I only have been here for not, not too long, so I missed the first part. Um, so I probably will be checking out the recording later on uh, to see you know, what other questions I might have. Uh, but just, yeah, in, in the work that we do, really uh, similar to uh, what Temple has said, just uh, looking for a lot of demographics about uh, families, um, you know, curious about really uh, families that may have moved out of uh, Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester into suburbs. Um, and uh, this really has to do a lot with uh, the visitors that we have coming to the museum. Uh, and trying to figure out, you know, who our audience is. Awesome, thank you so much. Yes, and um, our, our, this recording will be up uh, later this week. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to just give us an email. Awesome. Uh, how about you, Didi? Uh, any takeaways from today? Allison, Courtney, anyone? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no, I just I didn't have any specific takeaways. I just thank you so much for this training, and I can't wait to play with um, with all the programs. It was really really exciting. Awesome. It's great to have this pool at our at our uh, display. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we encourage everyone to go into the portal. 
um, play around with it, you know, uh, find what you're trying to look for, and um, you know, we are available to help you discover some research questions and and dive really deep into it and how um, this can serve your community and your, and your interest. Um, and we will be holding another training um, in May. Our next training will be in May, so uh, please be on the lookout for that as well. Awesome. Thank you. Shuna, any last words? Yeah, I just want to say, I think if you have any other questions uh, and or if you want to brainstorm with us, we're very happy to set up individual meetings with you all. And we could more target it towards your own question or towards your own project. So feel free to shoot us an email or if you want to set up any individual meetings. And uh, I'll be sending out a survey to everyone uh, later today or early, early tomorrow morning. So if you can please just do that. It's a quick survey. It just helps us uh, uh, continuously to improve uh, this training. So we thank you everyone for attending today's Bari training. And we look forward to seeing you guys in May. All right, guys, have a good one. Thank you so much.